Hello everyone, welcome back to Decades. In today's video, we have another Cornwall adventure up our sleeve. And we're in a town that people are going to struggle to pronounce. Including myself, you see I thought this place was called Launceston, as per its spelling, but no, it's according to the Cornish, Lanson. It's a nice little town with a church that has blue clocks on it. And one of its biggest attractions is this discarded washing machine on the side of the road. The only reason we were here really was because we were staying in an Airbnb in the town. It was a snazzy little place and it came with complimentary cans of Stella. In my brief time here I can tell that this historic market town is characterised by its quiet, almost sleepy streets. Situated only one mile from the Devon-Cornwall border, Lanson respectably has little interest in being a tourist hotspot, and this place certainly doesn't lack for charm. Discarded washing machines in the street are one thing, but Lanson's skyline is dominated by something infinitely more interesting. So join us today as we explore the history of Lansing Castle. Like many castles that dot the English landscape, Lansing Castle was constructed following the Norman conquest of England in 1066, likely sometime after the capture of Exeter two years later in 1068. So for the best part of a millennia, we've been debating how to pronounce this town's name. So if any residents are watching, please clarify, is it Lanson, Launson, Launston, or Lanston? Somebody in this town has to know, and while we're at it, Whose washing machine is this? Please never remove it. Give it protected status. When I come back, this better be there. The area at the time was known as Dunheaved, and the strategic placement of a fortress here was intended to establish control over the area between Bodmin Moor and Dartmoor, as well as ensure access to Cornwall. To this day, Lanson is known as the Gateway to Cornwall. Being only a mile from the only county that borders with Cornwall, that being Devon, it used to serve as a main thoroughfare deeper into the county, and though dual carriageways exist now, it retains its title due to the fact that the A30 passes directly next to this place. But that's some added detail. The castle's earliest structure was comprised of a defensive mart and a bailey surrounded by ramparts comprised of timbers. It's believed the original castle was established by Robert, the Count of Mortain, who had been granted the Earldom of Cornwall by William I, also and perhaps most popularly known as William the Conqueror, who had become the King of England following the defeat of King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings. Now, I've never usurped the crown, at least not to my knowledge, but taking a throne or any position of power by force doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to accept it once you're in charge. So, in the years that followed, the Norman efforts would turn to pacifying the rest of England, establishing dominance and quelling uprisings. One quick way to demonstrate that you're in charge now is to build a metric f ton of castles. The Normans had a method of constructing castles that was relatively cost effective, easy to construct, didn't require much skilled labour, and allowed them to quickly move on to the next one down the road. They built hundreds of these modern bailey fortifications and a good hundred of them still exist today. But anyway, the castle here would serve as the administrative centre for the Earldom of Cornwall around this time and was utilised by Robert's court. The castle would be first documented in 1086, with limited records between this time and the 13th century. However, what we do know is that Robert's son, William, would rebel against King Henry I in 1106, resulting in the confiscation of his lands, including this castle. It would be held by Reginald de Dunstanville, an Anglo-Norman nobleman and illegitimate son to the king between the years of 1141 and 1175, before eventually passing to the possession of Prince John around 1189 upon his acquisition of the title of Count of Mortain. Upon John's rebellion against his brother in 1191, whilst Richard I, otherwise known as Richard the Lionheart, was away on conquest during the Third Crusade, the castle would be repossessed by the crown. Upon his ascension to the throne after Richard's death, though, King John would pass it to Hubert de Burr, Sheriff of Cornwall. Now that is a distinguished name. Hubert. 
and during the late 12th century a circular keep would be constructed atop the man-made mound and buildings in the Bailey area would be rebuilt in stone. The town borough at Lansom would be formally recognised in 1201. In the decades that followed, a settlement would crop up outside the castle gates. Some residents would be moved out from the interior of the Bailey. In 1227, Henry III's younger brother Richard would be granted the Earldom of Cornwall. With the fortuitous Cornish tin mining industry's profits behind him, he would reconstruct Lanson's defences, even though he seldom actually visited Cornwall considering his involvement in politics and conquest, and this has led to speculation behind his motives. Perhaps he was attempting to impress the nobility of Cornwall whom he had an uneasy relationship with. But regardless of why, Richard would reconstruct the walls and gatehouses, establishing a high tower to increase the keep's stature, dominating the landscape from atop the mound even more than before. From these heights, one can see for miles taking in scenery, but also wind. Lots of wind. Worth it though, because it's hard to argue against the views that my camera skills just don't do justice. A new great hall would be established in the southwest corner of the property. Around the same time, a small three mile in circumference deer park would be designated to the southwest of the castle, supplied with deer from another park. As for the town outside the castle gates, Richard would build another wall surrounding that, making for an effective defensive measure, but also no doubt an impressive sight to visitors. And upon his passing, the Earldom of Cornwall would pass to his son, Edmund, in 1272, relocating the administrating hub of the Earldom to Loswithiel closer to the tin mining industry that was booming in Cornwall. Lanson would remain significant as a symbol of the local governing, however, it would be left to fall into disrepair. Edmund would pass away in 1300, a satisfying year to die in, even if only for everybody but the person who died, Without an heir, the property would revert to the crown. King Edward II would grant the Earldom of Cornwall, along with the property of Lanson Castle, to his favourite, Piers de Gaveston. However, he would be executed in 1312, so the castle found its way to Walter de Boutreau. In the year 1337, Edward III's son, Edward, I love these creative names, perhaps better known as Edward the Black Prince, would be granted the title of Duke of Cornwall, therefore he acquired the castle. The fortification by the 14th century was in a state of disrepair, with a survey documenting several issues regarding the castles consistently skipped over maintenance. The walls that were meant to be repaired by the castle guard were deemed to be ruinous, and the structures inside the bailey were listed as decayed. Repairs would be undertaken during the 1340s, with Edward holding a council meeting at the castle the decade following, and Lanson began to see more and more judicial assizes. The castle would also serve the function of a jail. During the 15th century, Lanson Castle had little to do with the Wars of the Roses that began following the year 1455, besides from some fast changes of ownership towards the end of those conflicts. And in the 16th century, antiquarian John Leyland would visit the castle. He remarked that it was not the biggest he had seen, but might just have been the strongest. In 1548, Lansing Castle would have a part to play in Cornwall's political landscape. Sir William Body would be commissioned by King Edward VI to destroy Catholic shrines at Helston, a town on the other side of the county. Two local Cornish men would take issue with this and kill him. 28 local men would be arrested, tried and executed at the castle in response, which caused no shortage of anger amongst locals. 1549 would see the rise of the Prayer Book Rebellion led by Sir Humphrey Arundel. Rebels marched through Cornwall to Lanson and took it during the summer months. It's believed they faced minimal resistance. Sir Richard Grenville, the royalist charged with leading the efforts against the revolt, would be captured and kept imprisoned at Lanson, where he would die. The Earl of Bedford, a man named John Russell, would be tasked with bringing an end to the uprising, retaking Lanson Castle and capturing Arundel, who would later be executed in London for his involvement. The adjacent town would start using the castle grounds as a tip, and the deer park would also be disused. By the end of the 16th century, the castle was once again abandoned. It would become unabandoned in 1637 though, when it would be used as a prison once more. 
this time to hold John Bastwick, an English Puritan physician and writer whose works were deemed controversial. As an example of how controversial his books were, he condemned bishops as enemies of God. The Puritans were low church English Protestants who, during the 16th and 17th centuries, sought to rid the Church of England of all Roman Catholic influences and practices. They weren't awfully fun at parties either. They also played leading roles in establishing colonies in what we know today as the United States. So, we'll add that one to the list too. A few short years later, the English Civil War would break out between the Royalist followers of Charles I and the Parliamentarian forces backed by, of course, Parliament. Lanson would remain dominated by royal control until it was taken in February of 1646 by Sir Thomas Fairfax. It would be rendered redundant by royalists before they retreated from the town. The timber was given to locals to use as fuel for fires. The lead from the roofs was stripped, and the castle was documented as being in such a poor, useless condition that Parliament did not even bother slighting it like they did to many other castles that they had captured. In 1656, Lansing Castle would also be used to hold George Fox, the founder of the Religious Society of Friends, or more commonly known as the Quakers. The Quakers are a group of Protestant Christians who would refuse to participate in conflicts, wear plain clothes, refuse to swear oaths, oppose slavery and abstain from drinking. Their independent nature made them quite controversial. Lanson would just be one in a sea of many places where this man was confined in his lifetime. However, he didn't exactly enjoy great conditions whilst he was here. Following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 with Charles II taken to the throne, the jail would still find itself in use. However, it would be allowed to fall into disrepair rapidly, with male and female prisoners having to sleep in the same quarters as a result. At the time, it was looked after by Sir Hugh Piper. In 1662, the Crown would grant the post of constable to two generations following Hugh in exchange Hugh agreed to spend over a hundred pounds in repairs to the castle, or should I say prison. For the best part of another century, the Piper family would hold the constableship and castle until 1754, when George II appointed several constables responsible for running the facility. Going forward, Lansom would fade in significance. Its jail had a long reputation for unhealthy, dirty, poorly maintained conditions, and with the establishment of Bodmin Jail closer to the centre of the county, it simply no longer made sense to run. As a result, the jail within Launceston Castle would be fully closed and demolished by 1842. At the same time, a public park would be landscaped in the area at no small expense, I'm sure. Going into the 20th century, the bailey was levelled out in order to contain Nissen huts, forming a hospital for the United States Army stationed in England during the Second World War. Archaeological excavations would be carried out on the site during the early 1980s, uncovering the medieval buildings that once stood here. As for today, Lansing Castle is owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, but operated by English Heritage, averaging a few dozen thousand visitors annually, making it a nice quiet day out, usually speaking. Lansing is an interesting town. It has a snazzy castle at its core, and yet the town is relatively unmolested by tourism these days, and card payments come to think of it, a lot of places are cash only. Of course, those who come to Cornwall probably want to go a touch further than a mere mile deep, and as a result, we could find some cheap yet very good accommodation here. The castle being here was just a complete happy accident on my part, but considering it was just a short walk from the Airbnb I was staying at, I felt it was only right I came and had a look. And no, I didn't drink the complimentary Stella. I won't say I have standards, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And that brings us nicely to the end of this video. It's a cool castle to explore. If you're in the area, I highly recommend taking a couple of hours to explore it. As for the moral of today's video, if you see a washing machine when exploring out in the wild, run. Thanks for watching everyone, really hope you enjoyed. Be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, share the channel with your friends, all that lovely stuff if you fancy it. And with any luck, we'll be seeing you all very soon with another video at some point. But until next time, take care and farewell.